Uh, hello, welcome everyone for the Pico seminar series, which is part of the Pico Electrodynamics Theory Network. So the aim of this uh, Pico seminar series and also of the Pico Electrodynamics Theory Network at Purdue University is to look into the Pico scale electrodynamic phenomena occurring deep inside the matter and look into the all the macroscopic manifestations of this. As a part of this Pico seminar series, we have invited several uh, experts uh, varying from the computational electrodynamics, many body physics, uh, like the uh, theoretical condensed matter physics, and also the material science. Uh, today, we have a, another exciting speaker, uh, Professor Prasanna Balachandran from uh, University of Virginia. Now, Professor Jacob will introduce him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satvik. Um, so, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Prasanna Balachandran uh, to our uh, PICO seminar series. Um, he leads the material informatics group uh, at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I believe he has a joint appointment with a primary appointment in the Department of Material Science, but also an appointment in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about his uh, background and achievements. Um, he's uh, um, currently, of course, the assistant professor at University of Virginia, and he obtained his PhD from Iowa State University. And... Um, since uh, his PhD, he has uh, worked at the theory division at the Los Alamos National Uni uh, Laboratory. And also he spent um, some time at Drexel University also uh, doing his postdoctoral research. So he has a rather broad uh, set of interests, but one of his expertise and really um, important contributions in recent times has been in really bringing info information science methods, data science methods to density functional theory and materials discovery. So we are definitely eager to uh, hear from Professor Balachandran and we look forward to kind of also learning a lot from him. So thank you once again for accepting our invitation and it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so to, to Satvik, Zubin, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, beautiful. So thank you. Thank you very much for the such a gracious introduction. Uh, you know, my name is Prasanna. Uh, I'm at UVA uh, in Charlottesville. Uh, uh, you know, I, I want to start by first and foremost thanking the Pico Seminar uh, uh, group uh, to to invite me for this uh, and, and share some of the recent things that we are trying to do in our lab. So, and I also want to especially thank Satvik for, you know, for putting together uh, this wonderful series and, you know, for all the organizational help. So, so thank you, Satvik, for working with me, uh, you know, through this, uh, through this whole, whole event. So, uh, you know, for the next 35 to 40 minutes or so, uh, you know, I have I have a few few things that I want to share with you all. So, uh, you know, in my group, we we are a fairly diverse group in the sense that we have two broad capabilities that we are, uh, you know, trying to apply to you know to to the material science domain uh, to understand materials properties and eventually discover new materials with uh, better properties than the state of the art. So. Uh, so we are a computational group, uh, but we work exclusively with experimental colleagues to, you know, to help realize uh, some of our predictions and also help us, you know, think about the problem in an optimal way. So, uh, you know, we, you know, we, you know, in terms of computational capabilities, we focus exclusively on first principles based computations and data driven machine learning methods. Uh, I mean, in this talk, I think it's going to be rather heavily skewed towards the uh, the AI side of our research uh, effort, uh, which is essentially the application of data-driven machine learning methods to help, uh, you know, guide processes, uh, uh, guide search for chemistry and compositions with the property that we're looking for, right? So, uh, so I'm gonna, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, as as I walk through the slides, the outline and so on is going to be clearer, but but hopefully this is the backdrop. Uh, you know, under which I'm going to operate for the next 30 minutes or so. And so, you know, before I proceed, I wanted to, you know, briefly uh, introduce my team. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have a, we have, a, you know, pretty eclectic group. Uh, we have uh, students from high school to postdocs, uh, you know, working on different problems. Uh, uh, you know, there are two important people not in the picture, Daniel and Gayathri. So Daniel is an undergraduate student. Uh, Gayathri is a high school student. Uh, and we're also grateful to the funding support from various funding agencies, without which we cannot, you know, I could not have assembled this fascinating group of people. So, uh, you know, as I go on, I'm going to, you know, hopefully connect, uh, uh, 
individual person to the different projects so that you can see who did what. Uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful for this team. Okay, so, uh, you know, before I get into, you know, before I get into a, to the discussion of this particular seminar, uh, you know, I do want to very briefly touch upon some of the ongoing projects in our group. So, you know, broadly, I would divide it into four different categories. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, you know, high entropy materials, be it alloys or oxides, uh, you know, where the goal here is to tailor chemistry, composition, crystal structure, uh, you know, to, to obtain desired mechanical and thermal properties. Uh, uh, you're also interested in uh, high temperature materials, uh, especially radiation uh, barrier coating materials, where the goal here is to essentially design point defects in materials to tailor some of the optical properties of interest. You know, not only, you know, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the structural and optical and thermal side, we're also interested in working with our colleagues, uh, you know, who are interested in additive, manu additive manufacturing. So you have an ongoing project on applying machine learning methods for uh, thermoelectric applications and so on. So, uh, and finally, we're also interested in magnetic materials. And, uh, you know, we just had a project that got recently concluded on skirmions, uh, where again, the goal is to, you know, predict the magnetic properties as a function of, again, crystal structure, composition, uh, chemistry and so on, so that we can, you know, rapidly identify new materials with, with interesting properties, right? So, so you know, a little, little bit of an introduction to some of the current work that we do in our group, okay? So, uh, but the focus of this talk is going to be a little different compared to, you know, what, what I showed before. Uh, you know, I want to give you a flavor of, uh, you know, how we think about AI and, and where we think AI can have a lot of impact, uh, you know, be it computation, be it experiments, you know, it doesn't matter, right? So I'm going to introduce you to a couple of, you know, what I believe, what we believe in our group, some interesting problem statements, uh, and 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 then demonstrate some examples along the way to, you know, to show you how we have been thinking about AI. So, uh, so broadly, the the talk today is uh, is going to have three different flavors. Uh, uh, you know, one on uh, adaptive learning. We have been working on adaptive learning since 2015. You know, since my postdoc time at Los Alamos National Lab, uh, you know, we are still developing approaches for improving the adaptive learning capability. And more recently, we have been uh, augmenting the adaptive learning capability with an explainable AI. You know, I, I, I do hope to show you some examples about where we think explainable AI can impact uh, the paradigm of materials discovery and understanding. Uh, and finally, I mean, this is a fairly recent effort, uh, you know, where, you know, all, you know, every single model that we build, uh, you know, we have been interested in sharing it openly with the public. Uh, you know, along this end, we have been uh, building web applications, right? So, uh, so every paper that we write these days will accompany a, a web application, uh, you know, which one can think about as an extensible uh, or an extended supporting information of the paper so that, you know, you can interact with our models and then, you know, and then appreciate the work that we did and in the process, you know, accelerate discoveries and, you know, help us improve the model, you know, in a, in a much more global way, right? So, so broadly, this is how I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about it. So, uh, uh, so I'll start with adaptive learning and then show you explainable AI and finally finish with open sharing, okay? So, so let me start with the adaptive learning framework. Uh, so, you know, uh, so this has been a this has been a recurrent theme in a group, and in fact, uh, uh, you know what we've identified is that there are broadly two sets of problems, you know, where we think adaptive learning, you know, uh, it goes by different names, you know, uh, in, in different literature, you know, some some people call it active learning, Bayesian optimization, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so we have seen that this particular framework is especially helpful when we have a vast and complex search space. You know, when I say a vast and a complex search space. I'm referring to a search space where, you know, we have more than 10 to the power, power five data points uh, uh, to navigate and fairly high dimensional, right? So, uh, and, you know, there are some, some additional caveats that I wanted to add. So uh, let's say we have this vast and complex search space, uh, but the problem statement is such that uh, we only have access to a few data points for which, right? We, we know the experimental results. We know the property from, you know, experiments or high fidelity computation, right? So, uh, so what this tells us is that we have a an extremely large pool of uh, materials or data points for which we don't know the properties. So the goal is to identify, uh, for instance, interesting 
materials, compositions, uh, processing conditions uh, in this large space of unknown, you know, where we believe is is the you know is the interesting science is right. So so how do we do that, right? And one interesting caveat is that uh, you know uh, if if there is a physics-based tool, right? If there is a high-throughput computational tool uh, with the high-fidelity physics incorporated in it, uh, or if you have a high-throughput experiments uh, which can navigate the entire 10 to the power five or greater search space uh, in an efficient manner, in a rapid manner, you know, then you know, our attitude is that let's go run that experiment, let's go run that computation, right? So, uh, you know, where machine learning is helpful is when the current high throughput capabilities cannot solve or access this vast and third space, right? So I think that's the kind of problems where we believe uh, adaptive learning and, and machine learning and AI can have a can have an impact, right? So so that's one flavor. You know, there is another flavor, uh, an equally interesting flavor, right? So uh, the the important distinction between this flavor and the previous one that I just discussed is that. The search space is not as vast, you know, it's, it's about thousand or 10 to the power four data points, but, you know, each and every data point, right? Each and every experiment or computation is extremely expensive, right? As a result, right? You cannot in a brute force manner run every single experiment or every single calculation, right? In a timely fashion, right? So uh, the emphasis is on identifying the optimal experiment or computation so that you can navigate this again, you know, the search space in an optimal way, right? So uh, uh, in problems like this, uh, typically the structure property relationships are unknown. So the goal of machine learning uh, capability is to unravel the structure property relationship and optimally guide uh, the experiment and computations towards promising region in this, uh, in this design space so that you know, for every every investment that we make on an experiment or a computation, we get uh, the best result or the best output, right? So, so these are the two broad flavors where you know where we have seen the concept of uh, uh, adaptive learning or active learning or Bayesian optimization have become fairly fairly useful, right? So, uh, so so the basic idea is the following, right? So the idea is that you know if you have a you know I'm going to use some jargons here and. You know, you know, please excuse me for that, and I'm happy to address questions that you may have later. Uh, is that you know, imagine that you have a supervised machine learning algorithm uh, that can achieve, you know, improved performance with fewer training data, uh, provided you know we sample this vast and unexplored search space in an informed manner, not in a you know, not in a random way, but in a in a very informed way, right? So, and this is where some interesting strategies borrowed from, you know, control theory and, and decision theory and so on can be incorporated uh, within this framework. And I'm going to get into a couple of examples to to help you think about this in a in a very simple manner, right? So, so you know, if if we frame the problem in this particular fashion, right? One of the one of the first and the biggest challenges that we'll have to deal with is that we have to learn from small data, right? So, uh, you know, there's no there's no two ways about it, right? So this is the starting point because you know every data point is expensive. As a result, you know we cannot have millions and billions of data points, right? So we have to deal with a fairly small number. And you know to give you a flavor of what that small number is, you know I've put together uh, you know a, a snapshot of a table, uh, you know five different problems, right? So uh, and 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 you know try to give you an idea of. Uh, uh, how we started and the vastness of the search space, right? So, you know, if you look at it, if you look at the third, you know, the, the third column here, uh, you know, that is the search space, right? So in some problems we have a million, you know, in the example here, there were 11 million data points. In this example here, we have about close to a million. Whereas there are other examples where we have a thousand, 3000 and about 60s of, you know, 61,000 and so on, right? So this is the space that we are trying to grapple with, right? So this is a space that we have access to and we wanted to find something interesting there. And, you know, when we started applying these strategies to these problems, the, the column here identifies the size of our initial data set, right? So uh, in some cases it's as few as 20, uh, whereas in some of the cases it's as large as 170, right? And, and the way that we were able to assemble this data point is in some cases we were working exclusively with one particular research group, so we were able to pull data, 
you know, from their past work and assemble it. In other cases, we were able to pull the data from essentially surveying the literature, right? Based on the work that is done by other groups in different countries, different lab settings, but put together in order to solve a particular problem, right? But I hope, you know, you're beginning to appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, the smallness of the data that we're trying to deal with, right? So so if, if this is the problem, right, then then how, how are we approaching this problem, right? So, uh, so we have some, <laughs> Uh, uh, some some secret recipes, and it's not a secret anymore, right? So, uh, uh, to you know, to address problems like that, right? So, for example, so if you know, if you're dealing with a problem with very small data, uh, it's crucial that your capability must be able to quantify prediction uncertainty. So, uncertainty quantification is something which is going to be the front and center of everything that we do, you know, especially if you're thinking about adaptive learning. Right. So, and again, you know, given the smallness of the data, we cannot, you know, and fairly high dimensionality nature of the data, uh, uh, we try to incorporate domain knowledge as much as we possibly can. Right. So, I'm a material scientist by training. So, you know, whenever I think about a problem, uh, you know, and, and try to apply it and approach it from the standpoint of adaptive learning, uh, you know, one of the first things I see is where is the knowledge here? Where is the prior knowledge? Uh, you know about this problem that I can help inform my algorithm, right? So, uh, so another secret uh, uh, recipe here is to incorporate as much domain knowledge as possible uh, to inform the algorithm, right? And finally, you know, the third point is iterative learning, right? So, in some of the examples that I'm going to show, uh, we were not able to find optimal, you know, optimal material with the best property or the targeted property in the first iteration itself, right? Again, because of the smallness of the data and heterogeneity of the data, we had to you know, loop through our approach multiple times uh, and, and let the algorithm learn adaptively, iteratively, so that you know, eventually we find the best material with the property that we desire. Hopefully, you know, I have a couple of examples that will help you demonstrate this, this particular interesting, interesting idea, right? So, so broadly, this is how I, you know, we think about the problem, okay? And uh, uh, in fact, there are, you know, this is a snapshot of uh, some of the things that we have done, uh, uh, you know, where we have applied this adaptive learning idea for, ex you know, for, for accelerating materials discovery. And, you know, I don't have a lot of time to, to discuss every single paper here. So uh, as a result, I've cherry picked a couple of papers uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through our thinking, you know, rationale and idea so that, you know, so that you can resonate with the way we think and hopefully adapt it for the problem that you think is necessary, right? So, so, so with that, let me introduce the first problem, okay? Uh, so this is a problem which I did, you know, uh, uh, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with, my, with, my, with my postdoc mentor at Los Alamos National Lab uh, and, and uh, a colleague uh, uh, in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Case Western University, uh, Professor Alp uh, uh, Sherlioglu. So, uh, so the goal is very simple, right? So, you know, hopefully you can see the composition at the bottom of my screen. Right, this is the chemical space and the composition space of interest. Right, so so we were interested in a pseudo ternary phase diagram, right, uh, of of lead titanate based ferroelectric materials, right, and uh, we had a few you know degrees of freedom to deal with, right. So uh, we were we could tune the Me prime. So Me is not an element; it's just a, an ID. So uh, so we can tune Me prime. We can tune Me double prime. And you know, in this small list, I've given you the, the the accessibility to the various ME primes and ME double primes that our colleague uh, 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 at Case Western could actually synthesize in their lab. And we could also tune X and Y, right? The goal is simple: find X, find ME prime, find ME double prime, find Y, such that it satisfies two important properties, right? One is this particular stoichiometry or composition should result in a perovskite-like crystal, well, perovskite crystal structure, right? The backbone of a perovskite crystal structure is something that I show here, which has, you know, conic connection, uh, uh, you know, of the octahedral frame, framework and so on and so forth, okay? So the ME prime, ME double prime, TI, you know, they occupy the center of the octahedron. Uh, the bismuth atom and the lead atom can occupy, for example, randomly, uh, you know, at these sites here, these are called the A sites, right? So, so the goal is simple. So you mix them, they have to form in the perovskite crystal structure. And, right, 
it should also have a very high photoelectric Curie temperature, right? So, so this was an interesting problem, uh, uh, you know, which was of, uh, you know, which was, uh, you know, which really challenged the way that we think about machine learning and how we apply it for materials design because we, you know, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's a bi-objective problem, but one of the objectives we formulated as a classification learning objective, uh, the other as a regression objective. I'm, I'm going to walk you through the strategy, right? So, uh, so. So ideally, when we started this work, uh, we went to the literature as far behind as 1960s and so on, and we started putting together all the uh, data points, uh, you know, in this chemical space that the community, the research community as a whole, uh, were able to deal with. Okay, so uh, we were able to identify about 167 compositions, uh, which was already explored. Right, you know, people have made the material; they have. You know, essentially characterize the property, right? So, and you know, if you actually do the back of the envelope calculation, there were about sixty-one thousand possibilities. The goal is, well, you know, are there any interesting combinations that the community has missed, right? And can we use these machine learning like methods to, you know, an, an adaptive learning paradigm to basically discover those combinations, right? So that's the problem state. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is the uh, uh, the detailed algorithm that we came up with to solve this particular problem. So, you know, so it's, it's a, you know, we started with a, with a screening tool. This is the classification learning uh, tool. Uh, you know, let's say your, your input, you know, your input is all the 61,000 compositions. Uh, you know, the first tool, uh, the classification learning algorithm filters uh, the compositions that will form in the perovskite crystal structure. And only those that, are filtered by the perovskite crystal structure goes into the next uh, tool, which is the regression algorithm. Uh, and then there is a recommendation system here. This is where the, you know, the adaptive learning concept comes in. And you know, it recommends, uh, say, one composition uh, you know, for experimental trial. And then we perform experiments. right? And you know, there are two levels of feedback. One is at the structure level. Uh, our colleagues were able to process this particular composition through powder metallurgy route. Uh, and they characterize the structure using X-ray diffraction. So, you know, if the X-ray diffraction agreed with the prediction, uh, you know, then, you know, then that's a success, an interim success. And then, you know, after that, the colleagues were also able to essentially measure the Curie temperature using dielectric measurements, right? So if the X-ray diffraction did not result in the structure that we desired, then, you know, we still update the classification learning model but we do not measure, for example, the, the Curie temperature of the material because, well, the, the, the material is not a perovskite crystal structure anymore, right? So, you know, I hope, I hope this, this logic is clear to you, but, but I'm happy to explain it later in the Q&A session, you know, session, right? So, so we apply this loop and we were able to perform, you know, five independent iterations, sequential iterations, and we were able to run 10 different experiments, new experiments. And I'm gonna walk you through uh, because this is a fairly busy slide, right? Uh, the first iteration recommended the first composition. Ho hopefully, you can see my uh, my mouse pointer, right? The the machine learning algorithm predicted this to be a perovskite crystal structure, whereas the X-ray diffraction measurement indicated that this had secondary phase, right? So, so ideally, this was a failed prediction, right? So, because we predicted something that did not work out with the experiment. So, what we did was we went back we fed this failed result into the data set and we retrained the classification learning algorithm, right? And then we came up with the next set of predictions. And as a result, you have 2A and 2B, okay? So 2A is another composition, right? Uh, uh, a new composition that the uh, algorithm recommended, which is a little different from the previous composition. And we also you know, wanted to keep track of the previous composition. So the second iteration we had Two different recommendations, but the difference here is that you know the relative concentrations were a little different, right? So we were trying to see, you know, can our model learn uh, uh, why it failed and adaptively, you know, change the decision boundary uh, uh, so that we can identify the optimal boundary to to, to synthesize uh, this particular chemistry, uh, you know, with the optimal composition, right? So uh, so in the second iteration. Our experiments and prediction agreed plus one plus one, which means uh, you know this is a perovskite crystal structure. So we predicted the Curie temperature to be about nine hundred. Uh, experimentally, it turned out to be about seven hundred. We had a fairly large uncertainty, 
you know, ego says that, uh, uh, you know, this particular composition was recommended based on uh, exploration method. You know, I, I don't want to get into detail, but I can answer questions later. So, you know, hopefully you can now follow the logic, right? So uh, even in the second iteration, the, scallium, the scandium gallium still gave us some trouble. Uh, but then in the third iteration, we were able to see a plus and a plus, right? So, you know, so adaptively the model was learning, you know, even if it's a failed data, uh, you know, and, and, and adjust the decision boundary so that we were able to identify at the end of the day, the composition that we want with the desired structure and property, right? So, so we did this, you know, we did five iterations and the five iterations led to, you know, 10 new compositions. Uh, you know, if you, if you follow uh, the pluses and the minus here, you know, six of them agreed with experiments. Uh, 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 there were four disagreements, uh, which led to improvement. So we were able to also leverage even the failed results, right? So, and learn from failures to help teach a model uh, as to how to think, you know, in order to not fail in the long run, right? So, uh, uh, so this was an interesting demonstration. And in fact, this is a pictorial graph to give you an idea about, uh, you know, what were some of the new discoveries that came out of this work. So, uh, so these are the different combinations that one can have. Uh, uh, you know, if you see a dark blue line here, it basically suggests the literature already knows about it. Uh, so there's nothing new there, but then all the red lines that you see, right, are the ones where, you know, we were able to identify these connections for the first time uh, through this particular work, right? If you see a co continuous line, it basically means, you know, we were able to predict and successfully validate, uh, you know, where the prediction agreed with experiments. If it's a dashed line, it basically says we predicted, uh, but this work requires more optimization because our you know, preliminary validation approach did not lead to an agreement between, you know, machine learning and, and experiments, right? So, you know, you still see a lot of lines here, uh, which just goes to show, you know, a lot of unknowns yet in this particular research area. And, uh, you know, but but we moved on, uh, you know, and wrote this paper, you know, just to showcase the idea that we were dealing with, right? So, so this was one of the first works where, you know, the goal was that, uh, you know, we were able to use this learning algorithm uh, to recommend chemistries and compositions. And we let our processing colleague uh, do the processing, you know, based on their experience and expertise, uh, you know, make the material, characterize it, give feedback, right? So, so this was the first flavor. So in the second example that I'm gonna discuss, I'll, I'll try to be brief for the interest of time. Uh, uh, so in this case, we fixed the chemistry. So we were asking the question, well, you know, Processing is as complicated as identifying chemistry and composition. So, and in fact, uh, you you know we can we can map a very similar you know algorithm uh, uh, for processing uh, you know using the same ideas and the logic that we had for selecting chemistry or recommending chemistry and composition, right? So, so in the second example that I'm going to show now, uh, so this is a this is a work where we were able to. Uh, uh, you know, connect uh, adaptive learning algorithm, uh, you know, there is a specific name, I'll get to that, uh, with a thin film growth approach, right? This is a solution sharing approach. So, so which is what, which is a schematic here, right? So you have a heated substrate, right? So this is a, uh, this is called as a meniscus guided coating method or a solution sharing method. So we have a heated substrate, okay? And you have a coating blade and you inject your material of interest in the form of a solution right, with a solvent and a solute, all right? And then what you do is that you, you, you essentially move the blade in one direction at a particular speed, right? And as this process takes place, right, what happens is that through, you know, different phenomenon of heat transfer, uh, you know, there is a solid thin film that gets deposited along the way, right? And, you know, what, you know, one of one of my colleagues in, in chemical engineering at UVA, Professor Gaurav Giri, what he noticed was, uh, you know, depending on the tuning parameters that he had, for example, the temperature of the substrate, the speed with which he could receive the coating blade, uh, the composition of the solution and so on, you know, he could, he could get films with complete coverage. Uh, he could also get films that lacked complete coverage, right? Where there were pinholes, you know, and other macroscopic defects, right? So, so the problem that was posed to us was very simple, right? So, can we identify the optimal processing conditions as defined by the knobs that they can tune in the lab that will give rise to a coating with complete coverage, right? 
So uh, can we predict that and, and can we identify the boundary that separates the two in a, in a rapid way, right? So this was the question. So, uh, so, so here we directly linked uh, processing conditions to you know, a technique called this pool-based active learning. And soon, soon I'll, I'll explain why this is called as a pool-based active learning, right? And uh, you know, the credit goes to Roberto. He was the graduate student, uh, you know, who was uh, who was largely involved in the machine learning ideas. Uh, and again, thanks to Professor Guri and his uh, students for the experimental support here. So this work got you know was recently published uh, uh, in the ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. Right. So so this is the workflow, right? The one that I'm showing you here is the workflow. So so we went back and we asked Professor Guri's group as to you know, what are the different knobs that you have and how many combinations do exist, right? So, and we figured it out that if we, you know, given all the conditions and, the, and their capability, uh, we could enumerate as many as 11 million possible uh, experiments that they can run, right? So, and, you know, in, it's, it's not possible to run 11 million experiments, uh, you know, in, in, in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime, right? So in a, in a, uh, in a, in a short span. So, uh, the goal is well. Can we identify, you know, instead of running eleven million experiments, uh, uh, you know, the the best experiments which will help us decide the decision boundary between, you know, which will result in full coverage and lack of coverage, right? So, so the way we, you know, develop this problem is as follows: we, you know, we had these inputs from processing conditions, right, and we defined an orthogonal array, an experimental design, right, uh, uh, you know, which was an interesting approach. Uh, uh, and our colleagues said that they can make 18 experiments at the same time. So, you know, what we did was given all possible experiments through uh, experimental design, again, no machine learning involved here. This is purely design of experiments idea, right? So, you know, pick uh, 18 data points, you know, with the best space filling property, right? So, uh, and then we performed experiments. We characterized the sample through optical and, and, and X-ray diffraction data, right? And these 18 data points became the training data for our machine learning work, right? So, and in, you know, in this case, uh, this is a little bit of a detail, but but Professor Gree's group were able to, uh, uh, you know, run this experiment. You know, for every every data point, they were able to repeat this experiment three times, you know, to get the statistics uh, to inform our machine learning approach. So we had the training data, we built the model, so the model can essentially predict well. Given these processing conditions, will this result? In a fully covered thin film or not, you know, and we built a probabilistic classification learning model so that it's not a deterministic model. It gives you the confidence as well, uh, on top of uh, uh, you know predicting whether it is covered or not, right? So, uh, and then we apply this training model, you know, for the virtual data, the unexplored data, you know, still uh, close to eleven million, and then we used an idea called as uncertainty sampling. I'll, I'll show you what it is. Uh, and given the fact, you know, in the previous example, right? So our colleague, they, they liked one experiment at a time, right? Very sequential. Here, our colleagues were interested in running 18 experiments at the same time, right? So, uh, so this is where the pool-based learning comes in, right? Because it's not one recommendation at a time. We have to provide 18 recommendations at a time. And this 18 recommendations should be such that, you know, it's diverse and yet representative, right? So you know, so that the, you know, the resource is well spent. So we developed an algorithm for that balancing diversity and representativeness. You know, we gave new selections and we iterated a couple of times in this process, right? So, uh, and then I'm gonna show you what came out, okay? So, so this was the first experiment, right? So after design of experiments, 18 samples, uh, uh, we, you know, 12 of them were not covered. Uh, six of them were covered, okay? The hashed spacing indicates that out of the three experiments, at least one suggested that it was not covered, but two of them suggested it was covered. So there is some element of, you know, uncertainty or process to process variability here, right? So, so that, that's what the hash indicated, right? So, so this was the training data, okay? And then we applied machine learning model, learned from this training data, right? And then we predicted, uh, you know, the expected coverage for the 11 million possibilities, okay? So this is how it turned out to be, okay? Uh, even in the machine learning, we were able to, you know, attach confidence, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you see no hash, if you see a, a fully filled uh, box, then the model was confident it is not fully covered. If you see a hash, that goes to show that the model was not confident, right? These are the interesting data points. 
the, the ones that are not confident so that, you know, that's where the decision boundary is. And that's what we were after in this particular example. All right, so this was, the, this was what the model thought uh, of the 11 million possibilities. And then from the 11 million, right, we recommended 18 experiments, all right? And we solely focused on uh, those regions that had the, you know, that were representative in the sense that model predicted the overall consensus was that, was that it will form highly, you know, it'll form, it'll be fully covered, but there were uncertainty, right? So, so we did this uncertainty sampling and, you know, the pool-based active learning using a maximum space filling strategy, we recommend, recommended 18 new experiments. So this was the outcome from the 18, right? So in, in this case, 12 of them were fully covered. Six of them were not fully covered, which was, which was very, very interesting. And a, a substantial portion of them were fully covered with a lot of confidence, all right? So, so this is to give you an idea of how the algorithm has recommended, you know, in this third space, okay? Uh, so I'm plotting, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, dimen you know, it's a, it's a, we use some dimensionality reduction algorithm because the original space was five dimensional. We projected in 2D here. <clears throat> so the gray points, the background are the 11 million possibilities, if you will. Uh, the black points are the ones that were there in the initial training data. Uh, the red triangles were the ones that were recommended by the machine learning method. Uh, based on this uh, pool-based active learning strategy, just to visualize, you know, how the how the model has indeed performed, right? Uh, you know, and 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 then you know we got the result. Uh, you know, this was the final outcome, and then we trained one more model. You know, and our colleagues were happy with uh, the result that they got. So we stopped right here. We could not run repeated experiments, as you know, experiments are expensive and so on. So we were happy with the objective and then we went ahead and we started writing the paper, right? So, so what we learned here are simple, right? So we were able to identify the boundary that separates covered versus uncovered, but you know, which was, which was interesting and the objective was accomplished. So one of the things that we were not able to learn, you know, not only in this example, in the previous example as to, you know, why were these compositions recommended, right? So you know, if I go back to the, to the previous test case and show you that table uh, with all the data points, you know, why were these compositions recommended by the adaptive learning algorithm, right? So uh, uh, can we peek a little in, you know, can we peek into the black box model and try to get a better idea of what's actually happening in the model and why these recommendations came to existence, you know, so that we can learn more about the adaptive learning process and so on, right? So, so this opens up, you know, uh, uh, essentially the next set of uh, problem, which is the explainable AI part, right? So, uh, you know, so so we had an input, we had an output. This is what we did with machine learning, established this function. So the prediction is what we were doing so far, right? But we started asking the question, where is the science here, right? So in, in, addition, in addition to prediction, uh, can we also extract something more from the model, right? About the function itself, so that we can learn, you know, what is happening along the way and, you know, build an intuitive understanding of the, complicated process that we are trying to deal with, like the complex structure property relationship, right? So, so this led to this explainable AI paradigm in my group, okay? And, you know, there was a beautiful review from Lipton, uh, you know, where he said that uh, there are some things needed in model interpretability research, you know, for instance, you know, trust, causality, transferability, informativeness, you know, fairness and ethical decision-making. In principle, I, you know, I believe he was arguing for uh, an interpretable approach to consider all these critical factors, you know, so that we can learn more about the world and the problem and, and approach it in a much more, you know, in a, in a, in a much more strategic manner, right? So, uh, so we were interested in a couple of interesting properties of these models, transparency, because we wanted to see what the model has learned. And the next is post hoc model interpretability, right? So, and that is going to be the focus of this work, okay? So our motivation is the following. We know that the adaptive learning uh, repeatedly has shown, not only based on the work that we did, but also in the literature, uh, a lot of beautiful, you know, beautiful work in the literature. We know that they effect, they're, they're effective in guiding experiments and computations, but can we examine, you know, the models, right? A bit more, and can we explain the models better? That led to this whole new trajectory of, you know, integrating explainable AI algorithms into, into this approach. Right, so so you know this is this is more of a uh, you know a, a partial view of 
the different wrappers that are available to us for the explainable AI work, right? Broadly, they are divided into two categories, global and local. Right. In fact, you know, the machine learning community, rather the materials informatics community, uh, are fairly familiar with this concept of variable importance. Right. You have a model, uh, and and there are well, you know, simple methods to help you unravel what are the key descriptors that the model thinks. Right. In order, you know, for it to fit your data accurately. Right. But there are a whole another set of tools out there, you know, which are local explainers, and you know, that probes marginal dependencies and so on which the community has not, you know, yet looked into uh, sufficient detail. So, so we were, you know, so we saw this as a gap and we, we thought, you know, let's go try some of the other methods and see if we can learn more about the model so that we can, we can make, again, you know, as I indicated, you know, interesting decisions, important uh, and, impo and, and informed decisions, right? So, so, you know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So, uh, and, and, and give you, a, you know, a slightly overarching view of the way we think uh, about this approach is that, you know, we have a, you know, the, 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 the model training, model validation, model testing loop is essentially the same. Everything that we have, you know, shown before, but what's new is the following, right? So once you have these models trained, right? The next step uh, involves essentially applying some of these local explainers, right? The one that I discussed here, right? So let's, you know, let's apply these local explainers. Let's break down uh, uh, for example, the model predictions uh, at the level of every individual data points, uh, you know, really understand from the standpoint of the model, uh, what it has learned, you know, you know, excuse me for, you know, keeping this at a very high level, because, you know, discussing details is a whole another talk, whole another lecture, uh, right? So, and, and once we were able to break this down, then we, we also did some clustering analysis to identify, you know, what are the common structure property relationships and then visualize the results in some very strategic manner to, you know, to basically uh, unravel the outcome of uh, the entire work, right? So, uh, you know, I credit uh, uh, Kunte, Dr. Lee, uh, who's the postdoc in my group, uh, who's the architect of this work on the high entropy alloy work, uh, and, and Mokil, uh, who's a PhD student in my group, was also instrumental in building a lot of algorithms, uh, you know, for this particular work. Right, so so just to give you an idea, so this is how a global variable importance will look like. Something that the materials informatics community is very familiar and comfortable with. Right, so uh, on the x-axis are the you know the x-axis is the cross entropy loss or any loss function that is of interest. Y-axis typically the uh, the variable of interest. Uh, the length of the bar basically tells you uh, the relative importance of the various input features that you have in the model. Right, so so according to the global explainer, at least for this particular problem, it, bas it basically says every feature is important. Right, so uh, uh, so we could not distill anything interesting out of this particular model. Right, but then you know when we started venturing at a local level, right, so this is a similar variable importance plot, but not for the entire data set. This is for a very specific alloy composition in our training data. Right, niobium, tantalum, titanium, vanadium. Uh, this was predicted to form in the PCC crystal structure. So what this graph essentially tells you is that what are the various factors uh, that helped the algorithm make this decision about this particular composition, right? So it says, you know, maybe the, the melting temperature, covalent radius, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are the key factors uh, that the algorithm has taken into consideration, you know, when it comes to predicting, for instance, the value of this particular composition to form in this particular phase, right? So, I mean, the granularity at which that we are, you know, exploring here is fairly unprecedented. And there are only a few literature in the materials informatics uh, uh, community who are looking at this at this particular way. So, so this was very, very interesting to us, right? Uh, another way of understanding plots like this, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at this plot, you know, the, the comment uh, that one can make is that, you know, melting temperature is important. Covalent radius is also important. Maybe, you know, the frac P balance is not that important because it's, it's not, you know, it does not have a large weight, right? But this plot doesn't tell you anything about, for example, the functional dependence, right? Is it, is it important? And is, it, is the relationship linear or nonlinear, right? So, so it doesn't give you a feel of uh, the functional form of the relationship between them, right? And that led us to a whole another set of, you know, local explainers. This is called as a Saturus Paribus plot profile plot, this is also a plot specific to, for example, uh, uh, the niobium, tantalum, titanium, vanadium example, right? So, so here, you know, every black dot that you see is the 
value that corresponds to this particular niobium, tantalum, titanium, vanadium alloy as a function of different features. And the continuous lines that you see here, right, essentially indicates what the model thinks, right? This behavior of this alloy will change. You know, if you keep everything else constant and change only one of the variables here, right? So uh, uh, this is a busy slide. So, you know, I'll explain this in this example here. So here I've taken one example called as fractional P valence, and I'm changing it from, you know, this is a normalized value from zero to one, uh, right? And the different colors indicate the different phases uh, this particular alloy came from, right? Red is BCC, uh, 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 cyan is FCC, uh, blue is a mixed phase, which means it has precipitates and so on. So what this plot tells you is that even though uh, uh, niobium, tantalum, titanium, and is a BCC because it has zero P electrons in the in the composition, right? So that's why it's zero here. But as you increase the P electrons uh, in the composition, this can be achieved, for example, by adding elements like aluminum and so on. So what it tells you is that if you add aluminum, for example, uh, the the probability for forming predict, you know, BCC phase decreases and the mixed phase increases, right? So so what this is telling us from a you know from a from a conceptual standpoint is that aluminum might react with these transition metals and may precipitate out uh, uh, an intermetallic compound, you know, essentially disrupting the single phase PCC structure and, and giving us the secondary phases, right? So, so, you know, we are beginning to appreciate and unravel these trends at this particular level uh, uh, so that we can begin to explain, you know, what the model has learned about every single data point, you know, in our data set and provide an interesting explanation. Right. So, you know, to map it back to the processing example that I talked about, uh, you know, this, this slide is not as pretty as the previous one, but I think it it captures the story. Right. So there was one data point, which we call it as data point number 10. Uh, you know, these were the specific numbers uh, uh, that we use to make this particular composition. OK, uh, this particular experiment resulted in a, you know, resulted in a thin film that lagged full coverage. OK, that's why you have a no here. Right. And if you look at the temperature as an example, you know, this is the temperature panel here, uh, 120 degrees. Right. So so a, a prediction of probability zero indicates it will not form full coverage. A prediction of probability one indicates it forms full coverage right in between, you know, is the degree of uncertainty. Right. So for a temperature of 120, this is where the data point would belong. Right. This is one of the reasons why, you know, the model thought that this will not be a fully covered sample. In, in, in agreement with the experimental result, right? But then look at this plot, right? So what this plot says is that if I keep everything else constant, right? Concentration of the solution, right? The speed at which the blade is moving, the number of passes and so on. If I change the temperature alone, right? From 120, if I crank it up, if I go beyond this 150, then the probability goes from less than 0 0.5 to slightly above 0 0.5, right? Indicating that likely, this can form fully covered film uh, if you if you if you if you if you do this particular step. In fact, uh, our colleagues went and ran this experiment, I believe, uh, at about 180 degrees, and then uh, we were able to indeed get, for example, fully covered film through as a result of this particular visualization through the explainable AI approach. Right. So, so this is again another demonstration of you know how you know we've been we've been you know we've been augmenting uh, some of these very simple visualization tools. Uh, with the machine learning models to to unravel what the model has learned, so that we can appreciate uh, uh, you know what is actually under the hood, and and use that for informed decision making, right? So 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 you know to to wrap up, right? So uh, uh, you know what I showed you so far, the first example, the first two examples is this optimization paradigm where you know we were able to identify chemistries and compositions and processing to get the desired result that we want. Uh, and in fact, as I indicated, uh, you know, a lot of uh, prior knowledge, domain knowledge has gone into creating these inputs, uh, right? And now what we're beginning to do is that on top of, you know, merely coming up with a prediction, we are also uh, adding aspects of XAI or, or the explainable AI to it. Uh, so that at, at the end of every single iteration, you know, we are generating tons and tons of data, tons and tons of insights to basically explain the question of why did this work? Why did this not work? You know, what did we learn at this stage and what is actually under the hood, right? Uh, the, the hope is that, uh, 
you know, by augmenting this optimization loop with the XAI, maybe we can begin to address that knowledge discovery loop uh, and, 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 you know, essentially get an intuitive understanding of the entire process, right? So, so this was the, you know, this was the paradigm that connects the two together, right? And finally, uh, uh, you know, I'll use the next two minutes or so uh, to discuss this yet another exciting work that is going on in, in our group. It's, a, it's another recent work where, uh, you know, one of the things that we are trying to do is that we are trying to build uh, interactive web application, right? So, so every machine learning model that we build you know, we are, you know, we are now building a graphical user interface and making it available to everybody through the web uh, so that, you know, every, you know, exciting result, we, we think these are exciting results, uh, can also benefit your research if you're also working in a similar problem in a similar domain, right? And the key architects of these, you know, the, the web app so far has been Sunidhi and Paige. Uh, Paige was uh, a high school student when she started doing this, uh, you know, with, with my group, and now she's a, uh, undergraduate student in the University of Richmond, uh, uh, you know, good luck to her, uh, you know, and, and, and some of the things that I'm going to share is based on their work. So, you know, these are the different links that I have here, uh, uh, you know, for the different problems that we deal with. So, so more recently for every, you know, for every new paper that we publish, uh, there will be an associated web application. So these are a couple of snapshots. This is the one here is for the high entropy alloy, uh, the one here for, for the multicaloric materials, you know, uh, chemical vapor deposition, growth of molybdenum disulfide, uh, uh, monolayers, and so on. Uh, so, so I'll, 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 you know, I'll maybe uh, zoom out a little bit and then see, uh, you know, if you can demo in a quick way uh, one of one of those apps, right? So that uh, so that you can see the functionality, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, stop sharing this particular. Uh, for example, the uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, the the presentation, and then uh, give you access to uh, the web application. So hopefully you can uh, see the screen now. So this is you know this is online, and I'm I'm doing this live, uh, right? So so this is the web web app for high entropy alloys. Uh, if if you go to this uh, HEA design, uh, so there is a field here where you can input the composition of interest. You can change the temperature. And once you do that, you can, you know, get descriptors, uh, and then you can predict properties, right? So in the back end, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, machine learning machinery, you know, that is running. And then, you know, once once it has finished its run, it gives you the result. Uh, so the first panel talks about, uh, you know, the prediction of the phase. Uh, the second panel talks about the mechanical property prediction. Uh, the third panel talks about the elastic constant prediction. This is another prediction of uh, for example, uh, the mechanical property by assuming a mechanistic model. I mean, this is a detail. Uh, so this, you know, the work that has gone into creating these these web applications is all documented here. You know, it's, it's a result of three different research publications, uh, uh, you know, that we were able to put together, right? And uh, we also have a tab called this data set. So, you know, for example, you can pick, uh, you know, any alloy of interest and use this uh, XAI capability to actually see the, the local explainers at work. Right, so uh, so this is a you know we believe a fairly neat work of communicating our work, uh, you know, with the research uh, uh, community of interest, uh, so that you can not only learn ideas from our paper, but you can also apply for your own research, right? So so that was the idea. Uh, I, th I think that's the last slide that I have. So uh, you know, thank you uh, so much for your time, and I'll, I'll take any questions from now. Appreciate appreciate your patience. Great. Um, thank you, Prasanna, for this very nice talk. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I feel that uh, the fact that you can actually take all this research and then um, give it to the research community through these kind of concentrated web apps, it's very useful. I think we will use it and we would also like to collaborate on kind of building some of these web apps in slightly different areas as well. Right, yeah. Really um, a nice, fruitful collaboration. So with yeah. that, I want to thank um, the audience for coming to the talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, Satvik for, for all these months of organization that he has done and brought in a lot of uh, exceptional speakers. And of course, uh, thanks once again to Prasanna for this really nice talk. Great. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording right now.